Good evening, everyone. We are waiting just a few minutes as people get admitted into the Zoom webinar. We'll get started shortly. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. We are waiting just a few more minutes as Zoom admits folks to the webinar, and we'll get started in just a moment. All right, it looks like most folks must be in already. Welcome this evening and thanks for joining us. I am now going to invite Hillwood's director, Kate Markert, to come on and introduce tonight's program. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kate Markert. I'm executive director at Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens in Washington, DC. Thank you for inviting us into your home this evening. Please make yourself comfortable. Your cameras and microphones are not active. Spring has truly sprung at Hillwood. And I hope that those of you who are in the DC area will visit us in person. We're open Tuesday through Sunday, 10 to five. Advanced reservations and time tickets are required to ensure a safe capacity. And of course, we ask visitors to wear masks indoors and out, regardless of vaccination status. To-go services from the Meriwether Cafe is available for those who want to picnic or grab a beverage while they stroll. Earlier this month, the porcelain flowers of Vladimir Konevsky went on display inside the mansion. You simply must see these exquisite sculptures of flowers. As the Architectural Digest writer Mitchell Owen said, if Madame de Pompadour were alive today, the taste-making mistress of French King Louis XV would surely be haunting Konevsky's Fort Lee, New Jersey studio. The installation will be on display throughout Labor Day, and this summer it will be joined by not one, but two fabulous additional exhibitions. Roaring Twenties, The Life and Style of Marjorie Merriweather Post, and Christine May's Rich Soil, life-sized figures constructed of wire, which will dance through the gardens. Of course, we will continue to gather virtually with friends and Hillwood members near and far. Tonight's lecture, is the first of three exploring floral themes related to the Konevsky exhibition. I hope that you'll join us for these upcoming programs. I also want to thank our members for their ongoing support and invite those of you who may not be members yet to join. You can learn more about membership, upcoming programs, and register online at hillwoodmuseum.org. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's lecture on women collectors of porcelain flowers and floral painting. I mentioned that your cameras and microphones are not active, but we still want to hear from you. Please say hello in the chat and share questions using the Q&A module as they cross your mind. Our moderator will make sure we get to them at the end. Our guide tonight is Dr. Rebecca Tillis, Hillwood's Associate Curator of 18th Century French and Western European Fine and Decorative Arts. She curated the Perfume and Seduction Exhibition in 2019. She is also the curator of this summer's Rich Soil Outdoor Sculpture Exhibition and is preparing for the Luxury of Clay, Porcelain Past and Present, which will open at Hillwood in February of 2022 She's also working on a spotlight exhibition entitled Marjorie Merriweather Post and the Diplomacy of Philanthropy at the National Museum of American Diplomacy in partnership with the State Department. To say that she is a productive curator is quite an understatement. Rebecca holds a PhD in art history from the University of Sussex, an MA in European Decorative Arts from the Bard College Graduate Center in New York, a BA from Wellesley College, and has studied at the Ecole du Louvre in Paris. 
please join me in welcoming Rebecca Tillis. Thank you, Kate, for that nice introduction and good evening, everyone. Can everyone hear me and see, see me? Um, I'm thrilled to present this lecture tonight on some of the great women collectors of porcelain flowers and floral painting over the last four centuries in celebration of the porcelain flowers of Vladimir Konevsky exhibition currently on display at Hillwood. While there are undeniably many male rulers, kings, princes, and aristocrats responsible for the founding of several European porcelain factories between the 16th and 18th centuries, Women often played a vital role in the promotion, patronage, and survival of these factories through the commission of diplomatic gifts and the creation of porcelain cabinets and fashionable interiors, and represent some of the most important collectors of the day. This evening, I have selected a group of women collectors from France, Holland, Germany, England, Russia, and the United States ranging from the 17th through 20th centuries, who had a passion for porcelain flowers, floral decoration, and objects intended for, for the display of flowers. While each of these women warrant an entire lecture of their own, I hope to provide a taste of some of these important figures within the context of the discovery and production of porcelain in Western Europe. I would like to begin in 17th century France with Madame de Montespan. Born in 1640 to a noble French family, she married the Marquis de Montespan, becoming lady-in-waiting to Queen Marie-Thérèse, wife of King Louis XIV, and eventually the official mistress to the king in 1667. The couple had seven children together, six of whom were legitimized, and many of her descendants married into the royal families of Spain, Italy, Bulgaria, and Portugal. Madame de Montespan, often referred to as, quote, the real queen of France, played a prominent role at court and had a strong influence over the king. She was also a great lover of both luxury and the arts, covering her walls with paintings and affording protection to many artists and writers, including Moliere. Between 1674 and 1680, Louis XIV commissioned the construction of the Chateau de Cligny for his mistress, located in the town of Versailles, just northeast of the royal palace. Employing many of the same craftsmen who built Versailles, including the king's architect Jules Ardois Monsard and royal gardener André Le Nôtre, Louis XIV gifted the Chateau to Montespan in 1685 towards the end of their affair. It was unfortunately demolished in 1769. On the left here, I'm showing you a detail of Madame de Montespan reclining in front of the barrel vaulted gallery at Cligny, one of the few surviving interior views of this grand piece of architecture, showing off the room's lavish pink marble and gilt decoration, which I hope you can see in the background, as well as silver furniture here and lacquer furniture. Decorating the top of these two large lacquer commodes in the background are an abundance of blue and white ceramic vases, likely a combination of Chinese Ming or Kangxi porcelain imported to France by the Dutch East India trade and French faience or earthenware made at Nevers or Rouen. These centers like Delft excelled at producing large faience vessels imitating Chinese blue and white porcelain. This was the period when France began experimenting with the production of soft paste porcelain, but had not yet developed the recipe for true or hard paste and was looking to Asia as models. In 1670, Louis XIV commissioned a pleasure pavilion for Montespan, known as the Trianon de Porcelaine, near the Palace of Versailles. Considered to be the first chinoiserie building in Europe, the small compound was composed of a cluster of five pavilions surrounded by gardens and was conceived as a royal pleasure ground and a retreat dedicated to indulging the senses, including tasting delicacies, smelling rare flowers, and listening to exotic birds. 
It was also used as a banqueting house and a meeting place for Louis XIV and Montespan beginning in 1671. The original name of the Trianon was the Pavillon de Fleur or Floral Pavilion, likely inspired by the King and Montespan's love of flowers. Thanks to hothouses, the Trianon was able to store flowers sent from the south of France all year long. The exterior of the pav pavilion, which I show you on the screen, was, de was decorated with a multitude of blue and white ceramic tiles imported from Holland, combined with tiles and vases made in Rouen and Nevers, as well as other centers of faience production in France. The detail on the right illustrates the surrounding blue and white jardinière, which you can see here, used to grow flowering plants. The stucco, woodwork, and the interior furnishings were also painted blue and white to match the tiles. Here are two surviving examples of faience jardinière made at Nevers during this period to illustrate the blue and manganese palette of decoration inspired by Asian porcelain and rural landscape scenes, combined with twisted rope handles and heads of Apollo characteristic of the Baroque style. In addition to faience jardinière, the Trianon also featured planters made of toll painted blue and white to imitate Asian porcelain, illustrated in the watercolor recreation on the left. On the right are the blue and white ceramic shards likely made at Nevers that were excavated on the grounds of the Trianon, similar to the jardinière with heads of Apollo from the previous slide. A portrait miniature originally part of a fan likely depicts Madame de Montespan in the Trianon de Porcelaine, visible by the blue and white tiles peeking through the windows on the left side of the image, here on the left. Attended by Putti, offering gifts of the most luxurious furnishings available at court at the time, Montespan demonstrates her power and influence as the queen of fashion and the king's favorite. It is no surprise that with such fragile architectural decoration, the Trianon de Porcelaine only survived 16 years and was subsequently demolished in 1687. It was replaced by the pink marble Grand Trianon, which still stands today. The next woman I would like to showcase is Queen Mary II, who was Queen of England, Scotland, and Ireland, co-reigning with her Dutch husband, King William III of Orange, from 1689 to 1694. The couple had multiple residences, but split their time primarily between Kensington Palace and Hampton Court in England and Hetlow Palace in the Netherlands. Mary had several passions, including gardening, Dutch Delftware and Chinese porcelain. The Dutch East India Company was the primary importer of exotic and expensive goods from Asia during this period, including porcelain and flower bulbs that were collected by the Dutch elite. Flowers and exotic plants were particularly coveted and the House of Orange had a great influence over the popularity of gardening. Dutch Delftware or tin glazed earthenware thrived during the late 17th century under Mary's patronage. The Delft factories responded to the queen's love of gardens and they developed the talent and technical skills to produce different types of vases with spouts to display flowers. Fragments of the earliest blue and white ceramics collected by Mary survive at Hetlow Palace, and her collection of Delft for garden vases are visible in the gardens on the right. On the left is a photo of Mary's orangery at Hampton Court that she built to house her collection of exotic plants, orange and lemon trees, and cacti. Every year, William and Mary's vast collection of plants were brought out of the hothouses and put on display during the warmer months in Delft vases of all shapes and sizes. Hetlow was the only residence that was built entirely by William and Mary and fully reflects Mary's taste. The interiors of Hetlow were designed by French Huguenot architect, designer and engraver, Danielle Marot, who created dense pyramid shaped arrangements of blue and white porcelain on mantelpieces and brackets integrated into the architecture and paneling of a room a reoccurring Baroque element in the display of Delftware. The inventory of Hetlow lists pieces of Delftware and porcelain in every room, with the exception of the book closet, and many of 
Queen Mary's Delft vases were referred to as being on and in front of the chimney piece. Moreau also designed a porcelain cabinet for Queen Mary, the design for which I show you on the left. Porcelain rooms communicated the wealth and prestige of its inhabitants. These designated rooms for porcelain and later Dutch Delftware first appeared in the Netherlands and quickly spread across Europe after several female members of the House of Orange promoted the concept abroad. Queen Mary's collection of Delftware at Hetlo is also known through excavations in the garden of her little basement kitchen, a photo of which I show you on the screen. We know she collected tall flower pyramids, garden vases, and preserved dishes, and admired the fine imitations of Chinese blue and white porcelain made by the potteries in Delft. Mary also played an important role in the creation and development of some exceptional pieces of Delftware. Several of Mary's flower pyramids and Delft tiles are conserved today at Hampton Court Palace, where she used her magnificent collection to decorate a pavilion in the garden known as the Water Gallery. This pavilion was intended as a retreat and adjoined the Delftware Closet, a room entirely dedicated to her Delftware collection. While the Water Gallery does not unfortunately survive today, this group of Delft tiles and flower vases may have once decorated such a space. Another female collector I would like to briefly discuss is Louise Henriette of Nassau Orange, who married Frederick Wilhelm, Elector of Brandenburg, and resided at Orenenburg Castle, north of Berlin. In 1662, Louise Henriette installed a small porcelain cabinet at Orenenburg. An inventory from 1699 reveals that the room was decorated with blue and gilt leather wall coverings colored flowers in plaster work on the ceiling and wall brackets and shelves around the chimney. As we saw with Queen Mary, the fashion for small porcelain rooms in the 17th and early 18th centuries was mainly developed and perpetuated by women. This was also a period when a change occurred in the manner of display and the appreciation of important collections of porcelain at European courts resulted in a new type of porcelain room. The main impetus for this development, which replaced the traditional Dutch mode of display, came from the Prussian court and influenced many other courts in Germany, beginning with the Saxon court in Dresden. So-called porcelain rooms were created from Constantinople to Sweden, from Russia to England and in Northern Europe, and were mainly influenced by the display systems developed in the Netherlands. Porcelain was moved out of the cabinets and curiosity rooms and became part of the furnishings of women's state apartments, indicative of the imaginative taste of ladies at the time. Along with the delicate and precious materials used in their decoration, such as porcelain, lacquer, and mirrors, the scale of originality was determined by the degree of illusion and ornamentation. In 1701, Louise Henriette's son was crowned Frederick I, first king in Prussia. He married Hanoverian Princess Sophie Charlotte, sister to the future King George I of England. Queen consort Sophie Charlotte built a Chateau de Plaisance known as Charlottenburg Palace in Berlin, named after its patron. In 1695, Sophie Charlotte installed a small porcelain room with gilded shelving and mirrored walls displaying 400 pieces of porcelain and 80 pieces of faience. Here is a photo of the porcelain room at Charlottenburg as it looks today. And I hope some of you have, have been to, in this room and, and visited Charlottenburg. The collection of Chinese and Japanese porcelain not only served as a demonstration of wealth and fashionable decoration, but as a dynastic symbol and political significance, a unique quality to Prussian porcelain cabinets. It is also worth noting that such a room was not used for state occasions, but as a private chamber only shown to a select few. And on the right, I show you one of my favorite details from the room, depicting these two coming out of the wall, uh, supporting a ledge with a group of porcelain teapots and vases in one hand and a large punch bowl with the other. While many of the objects in this room were made in the East, it is important to remember that this display is a Western interpretation of Chinese taste. 
Returning to France, the next woman I would like to feature is Marie-Joseph of Saxony, who became Dauphine of France through her marriage to the son and heir of King Louis XV and mother of Louis XVI. Marie-Joseph was born in Dresden in 1731 and was the daughter of Augustus III, Elector of Saxony and King of Poland. She also had a love of porcelain flowers and floral decoration. One of her earliest purchases from the Vincennes Porcelain Manufactory, founded in 1740, east of Paris, was the watering can on the left, probably used indoors for watering plants. The journal of dealer and chief merchant of Vincennes Porcelain during this period, Lazare Duveau, records examples of the second size watering can were sold to the Dauphine in January 1757. Between 1755 and 1757, 13 examples are listed in the sales records and only 10 of this so-called second size, demonstrating their rarity. Another early purchase by the Dauphine was the covered water jug used during the toilette shown on the right. The only example with a blue celeste ground and flower decoration of the second size made in 1754. The vibrant turquoise blue ground color, the most costly and difficult to produce, was invented in 1753 by the chemist Jean Hello to decorate King Louis XV's extensive dinner and dessert service made in 1754 for use at Versailles. This particular water jug is richly decorated with elaborate Rococo gilding and contains an unusual gold mount attaching the cover to the jug. Perhaps the epitome of the Dauphine's love of porcelain flowers is embodied in this one ambitious ensemble. This large bouquet known as the Bouquet de la Dauphine, composed of Vincent porcelain flowers and a central white vase and two figures, was a gift from the 17-year-old Marie-Joseph to her father, Augustus III, in the spring of 1749 presumably with the intention of making the high artistic quality of the Vincennes porcelain manufactory known in Saxony. It may also have been intended as a gift in recognition of the splendid mice and porcelain that the couple had received as a wedding gift the year before. Augustus III's father was the notorious porcelain collector and founder of the mice and porcelain manufactory, Augustus the Strong. Coming from a tradition of patronage and collecting of mice and porcelain in Dresden, Marie-Joseph would have understood the importance of these diplomatic gifts and cross-cultural exchanges. I would next like to focus on perhaps one of the most influential collectors of porcelain flowers and floral painting in the 18th century. I would also like to acknowledge the work of Dame Rosalind Saville, former director of the Wallace Collection, who has lectured and published extensively on the subject. Jean-Antoinette Poisson, known as Madame de Pompadour, was the mistress of King Louis XV between 1745 and 1751. Pompadour was only 23 years old and married with a daughter when she met the king at a ball in 1745 receiving the title of the Marquise de Pompadour shortly thereafter. Through her position as the king's favorite, Pompadour wielded considerable power and influence. She was elevated in 1752 to Duchess and in 1756 to Lady-in-Waiting to Queen Marie Lachinska, the noblest rank possible for a woman at court. Pompadour effectively played the role of prime minister, becoming responsible for advancements and dismissals and contributing to domestic and foreign politics. She was also an influential patron of the arts and played a central role in making Paris the perceived capital of taste and culture in Europe. Following the founding of the Vincennes Porcelain Manufactory in 1740, Pompadour orchestrated a group of shareholders in 1745 recognizing the unique opportunity to take the production further and celebrate its initial production of porcelain flowers in 1741. In February 1747, Louis XV and Pompadour's first purchases at Vincennes were porcelain flowers, like the ones you see on the right, spending 80,000 livres for their various chateaux by 1750. That's the equivalent of approximately $1.5 million today. 
Bouquets like this one were assembled using metal rods that I hope you can see here behind this large peony. In 1748, sales of Vincennes porcelain flowers accounted for 80% of the factory's revenue, demonstrating they were responsible for the company's survival during these early years. Women who made up half of the employees at the factory during the 1740s specialized in the production of porcelain flowers. The director of the flower studio was also a woman named Marie Gravon. I would like to thank Dr. Allison McQueen, professor of art history at McMaster University, who has shared some of her research on women painters at Sevres. On the left, I'm showing you a portrait of Madame de Pompadour dressed as a gardener, holding a basket of flowers and illustrating her enthusiasm for gardening and botany. To display fresh flowers at her Chateau de Bellevue, built for her by the king in 1750, Pompadour purchased 100 Vincennes porcelain wine bottle coolers between 1751 and 1752 for use as cash displayed on the mantelpiece. In addition, the garden at Bellevue was filled with scented Vincennes porcelain flowers. Pompadour also watched closely as the Dauphine's bouquet was being assembled in the autumn of 1748 and left France for Dresden as a diplomatic gift in January 1749, demonstrating that France could produce porcelain comparable to Meissen. The Vincent porcelain clock on the right, today in the collection of Her Majesty the Queen, was on the market within two years of Pompadour's death, suggesting that it may have been part of her collection or was a piece she admired. The clock is surrounded by porcelain flowers on stems, each with the appropriate leaves for their flower. Natural flowers were also often commingled with the porcelain ones. As the porcelain bouquet surrounding the clock is entirely removable, it is possible that the porcelain flower stems were placed in the vase during winter and replaced with with real specimens during the summer months. Influential collectors like Pompadour were responsible for promoting the fashion for luxurious objects combining mice and porcelain figures in, and Vincennes porcelain flowers with sumptuous gilt bronze mounts, similar to these two baskets of flowers from the 1740s. Pompadour purchased such objects from the dealer Lazard Duvaux, who specialized in the creation of such magnificent creations and is known to have assembled such curiosities for her. Duvaux's diary also reports deliveries to Pompadour of mice and porcelain potpourri vases like this one that are often associated with garlands or bouquets of Vincennes porcelain flowers. On September 1st, 1750, Duvaux delivered, quote, a potpourri from Saxony painted with a subject by Vato, garnished with gilded bronze and ground gold for 120 pounds, end quote. European flowers began to appear on mice and porcelain around 1740, as the demand for Asian patterns became less dominant and more high quality printed sources became available due to the growing interest in the scientific study of flora and fauna. The surface of this vase is covered with intricately modeled little flowers known as Mayblumen, after the German word for hawthorn blossom or May, which produced small clusters of flowers. Although Pompadour was the king's favorite during this period, she wasn't always well received at court. Her first ally was the Duchess of Parma, the king's eldest daughter. In 1748, the Duchess of Parma returned to Versailles for a year with her daughter Isabel and took a liking to Madame de Pompadour, resulting in a falling out with her sisters. Throughout the 1750s, Madame de Pompadour offered the Duchess a series of small gifts of Vincennes porcelain, including soup bowls, cups and saucers, and butter dishes. In 1750, she sent Princess Isabel at the Palace of Buen Retiro in Madrid, a clock by Lunoir mounted with Meissen figures and Vincennes flowers, similar to the example on the right demonstrating to the King of Spain that she was capable of making impressive gifts. In 1751, to acknowledge Pompadour's work and patronage of the Vincennes factory, a new potpourri vase was named after her, known as the Potpourri Pompadour, designed in art, at, by artistic director Jean-Claude Duplessis. She may have bought the one on the right from the factory for Bellevue. 
They were made in three different sizes between 1752 and 1759 and in two versions, one with holes on the cover only and one with holes on the cover and upper body, like in this example. There was even another shape without pierced holes called the urn pompadour. We will come back to this model when we look at the collection of Marjorie Merriweather Post. Pompadour's first porcelain dinner service, a tureen from which I show you here, was delivered in March 1753, nine months before Louis XV took possession of his Bleu Celeste service that December. This type of floral decoration with blue lines was a new style for the Vincennes factory. Pompadour was also heavily involved in politics and offered a number of diplomatic gifts of Vincennes porcelain to foreign figures abroad between 1751 and 1756. In June and July, 1754, Pompadour sent the Marquis of de Pont Zweibrücken, officer of the French army and later general of the Royal Prussian Army, an expensive turquoise blue tureen painted with flowers and a silver lining as a diplomatic gift, perhaps the same one in Hillwood's collection. According to the Sev records, two tureens of the largest size in Bleu Celeste were, were bought by Louis XV for the service du roi in 1754. This was the first time that the Bleu Celeste color was used on porcelain. That same year, this exquisite Vincennes cistern and basin with painted flowers and decorative motifs of sea, water, and shells was made for Pompadour. Contemporary manufacturing and sales records state that she owned two French porcelain fountains and 301 pieces of Vincennes and Sevres porcelain painted with flowers on a white ground. It was likely made for her in 1755 and acquired in 1756 through the dealer Lazard Duvaux. In 1756, at Pompadour's initiative, the porcelain factory moved to a new building at Sevres closer to her chateau at Bellevue. At Sevres, new enamel colors like rose pink were produced, soon becoming associated with Pompadour thanks to her infamous rouge makeup. Pompadour was influential in the encouragement and development of a particularly French style of ornamentation and the use of colored grounds like the terrine on the left. Cindy Sherman's Madame de Pompadour terrine and platter from Hillwood's collection on the right deliberately appropriates the 18th century Rococo style and its close resemblance is due to the fact that an original 18th century mold was used to create it. As the title of the terrine and platter indicates, the image of the woman depicted in the central cartouche is most likely that of Pompadour, highlighting the importance of her patronage in the development of porcelain in France. Pompadour was also very fond of the green enamel color and purchased elaborate tea services like the one on the right. In fact, she bought more green ground porcelain and Louis XV bought more pink ground. On the left, I show you one of the plates from Pompadour's service with a green ribbon pattern and floral garlands appropriate for a petit souper or small informal dinner party with intimate friends. In 1759, Pompadour went on a bit of a shopping spree at the end of year sale of Sevres held in the King's private apartments at Versailles. An inventory after her death in 1764 reveals that Madame de Pompadour had a pair of green and blue wall lights in the bedroom of her Paris townhouse, the Hotel d'Evreux, today the Elysee Palace, and another pair in green for her grand cabinet at the Chateau at Ménard. They would have been mounted on the wall flanking a fireplace with a garniture of matching potpourri vases on the mantelpiece. Madame de Pompadour is known to have owned three examples of the ship vase on the left, used to hold potpourri, designed to commemorate France's victory in a naval battle during the Seven Years' War. They were ex extremely difficult to fire and the multiple piercings in the body weakened the overall structure and they tended to collapse in the kiln. Consequently, only about 12 were ever produced, 10 of which survive today. She also owned this pair of pink and green wall lights and potpourri vases, a color combination invented to imitate fashionable chinoiserie decoration. Perhaps the rarest model in Pompadour's collection was this pair of elephant vases on the left, 
used to hold flowers, made in three sizes at Sev between 1756 and 1762, and originally part of a three-part garniture accompanied by a potpourri vase. These examples are distinguished, distinguished by the painted chinoiserie scenes representing the sense of smell and derived from an engraving after Boucher. The other scene represents the sense of hearing. This model was so popular that many European porcelain factories copied the design well into the 19th century. Marjorie Merwether Post acquired a pair of green elephant vases from the New York dealers and decorators French and Company in, in 1961, one of which I'm showing you on the right, possibly made in England by the Coldport factory. Their size and quality and accuracy of the modeling suggest, suggest they may have been taken from accurate sev molds or casts of molds, like the one in the center still at the factory today. The underside of the vases are likely marked with fake interlaced L's for sev that you can see in blue, with the date letter E for 1757-1758. Each is numbered 47471 in red, which you can see here, possibly identifying inventory marks from a Russian collection. Moving to Russia, Elizabeth Petrovna reigned as empress from 1741 until her death in 1762. Her court was one of the most splendid in Europe and a great number of silver and gold objects were produced to support her luxurious lifestyle. Perhaps the Empress's most important artistic legacy was the establishment in 1744 of the Imperial Porcelain Factory, one of the earliest European factories to start producing true or hard paste porcelain. By the 1750s, the factory had begun producing porcelain in the Meissen style. The plate and the spoon on the left are from the factory's first dinner service, known as Her Majesty's Own Service, made for the Empress around 1756 to 1760. Every piece was decorated with a graceful molded trellis pattern, suggesting they were part of a dessert service, perhaps to be used in the summer. The plate on the right, decorated with a white molded floral pattern, known as Gatskowski, raised flowers, a cluster of flowers in the center and the Imperial Russian double-headed eagle and the badge of the Order of St. Andrew on the border is part of a large dinner, dinner and dessert service presented in 1745 by the Saxon elector and King of Poland of August the third, Augustus the third to Empress Elizabeth on the occasion of the marriage of her nephew, Grand Prince Peter Fyodorovich to the future Catherine the second. This diplomatic gift from the Saxon court helped spread the Meissen influence in Russia just prior to the founding of the Imperial Porcelain Factory. And Meissen continued to furnish the Russian court with additions to this service. It was later copied by the Imperial Porcelain Factory in the 19th century. Moving into the 19th century, Lady Almina, fifth Countess of Carnarvon, was born in Paris as Almina Wam Wamwell the illegitimate daughter of the banking heir, Alfred de Rothschild. Despite never publicly acknowledging paternity, he left her his sizable fortune. Her wealth attracted the attention of George Herbert, fifth Earl of Carnarvon, who was land rich, but was struggling under the weight of huge debts. Their marriage in 1895, when Almina was just 19, saved the Carnarvon family estate. The couple resided at Highclere Castle in Hampshire, England, the setting and inspiration I'm sure some of you might recognize for Downton Abbey, where Almina collected exquisite French porcelain such as the Sev garniture of three lidded vases from 1781 on the top right, and the early 19th century fall front secretary by the German cabinet maker Bernard Molitor, inlaid with Sev porcelain plaques painted by Charles Nicolas Dodin from the 1770s or early 1780s on the bottom right. Almina was known to have expensive taste and enjoyed extravagant spending sprees on designer clothes and jewelry. She also loved to dance and host parties. Between 1924 and 1927, Almina began to sell some of her most valued possessions, many of which collected by her father, Alfred de Rothschild. 
At that very moment, Henry E. Huntington, who had lost his beloved wife and collector Arabella, decided to amass, through the help of art dealer Joseph Devine, a collection, including 18th century porcelain, that would form the basis of the Arabella D. Huntington Memorial Art Collection, conserved at the Huntington Art Gallery today. Marjorie Post acquired these two rare heart-shaped snuff boxes with enamel floral decoration from the collection of Alfred and Elmina de Rothschild in 1928. Now turning to the 20th century and our patron and founder, Marjorie Merriweather Post. As many of you know, Marjorie Post had a particular vision for the gardens at Hillwood when she purchased the estate in 1955 and worked closely with the landscape designers to create a series of outdoor period rooms that relate to the interior plan and decoration of the mansion. She extended and enlarged the greenhouse relocated and reconstructed the French parterre adjacent to the French drawing room and below her Louis XVI style bedroom and always used fresh flowers in several rooms of the house to bring the gardens inside. Like some of her 17th and 18th century collecting predecessors, Post also created two symmetrical porcelain rooms to showcase her collection of French and Russian ceramics from the 18th and 19th centuries and took an interest in the design of the display cases and pull out drawers for label text. One of the objects prominently featured in the French porcelain room is this pair of potpourri pompadour vases, similar to the model in the collection of Madame de Pompadour that we looked at earlier, that Post acquired in 1958 following the renovation of Hillwood. Potpourri vases were indispensable objects in an 18th century luxury household. The holes helped diffuse the fragrance from the flower petals and scented oils as indicated by the exterior floral decoration and the white carnations on top of the lids. Given Post's love of fresh flowers and porcelain, it is no surprise that she acquired a number of potpourri vases and flower vases for Hillwood. Luckily, in the case of this pair, we know the name of the painter who marked his initial L on the underside for Denis Levé, who was a painter of flowers and birds at Sevres between 1754 and 1805. Marjorie Post also acquired this flower vase known as a Cuvette Maon for Hillwood in 1965. It is an extremely rare shape and less than 20 examples are known today. The name refers to the town of Maon on the island of Menorca captured by the French in 1756 and celebrated as one of their greatest triumphs of the Seven Years' War. It was made in three sizes and we can attribute the design to Jean-Claude Duplessis, who was also the king's goldsmith, thanks to surviving design drawings and plaster models in the Sev archives shown on the right. Hillwood's vase is the largest size. This garniture of three flower vases known as Cuvette Corte was named after the Marquis de Corte, who was Secretary of Finance under Louis XV and one of the Sev factory's early shareholders and the first administrator. It was for Corte that the first example of this shape was presented. It was made in three sizes beginning in 1753 and more often in soft paste than in hard paste. The bulbous shape, popular during the Rococo period, was later adapted to a more neoclassical style of decoration in the 1780s, like the ones from Hillwood's collection. The central scenes featuring birds in nature were painted by Philippe Castel, and the spotted ground decoration known as Fond Tenandier, or Tenandier ground, was painted by Madame Genevieve Tenandier, another woman painter working at Sevres, who was likely the creator of this pattern. This potpourri vase, a gift from Marjorie's daughter, Eleanor Close Barzam, is a combination of a 17th century blue Chinese porcelain vase, a mice and porcelain finial in the shape of a pug dog scratching his ear, and Vincennes porcelain flowers, all mounted with French gilt bronze openwork scrolls, branches, and vines. Mice and pugs symbolize love and faithfulness, as well as Freemasonry in Germany, and porcelain examples were imported by luxury dealers in Paris who had them assembled in new decorative objects for their most important clients. Although Marjorie Post unfortunately never acquired a potpourri ship vase model, 
similar to the ones in the collection of Madame de Pompadour, she did acquire a rare album encompassing 250 watercolor lithographs of soft paste porcelain models after the originals made at Sev in the 18th century and published in 1892, illustrating many of these iconic shapes. These elaborate candelabra were a gift from Marjorie Post's daughters in 1967, likely for her birthday. Similar to the potpourri vase combining Chinese, French, and German porcelain, these gilt bronze mounted porcelain objects were another creation of the Parisian luxury dealer or Marchand Mercier and combined mice and porcelain figures with Vincennes porcelain flowers. At the top is a small pink silk shade, a later replacement, which unrolls to diffuse the light. Madame de Pompadour likely owned a similar porcelain mounted candelabra topped with Vincennes flowers that currently decorates her reconstructed apartments at Versailles, inspired by the colors and furnishings of the famous Boucher portrait on the right. It is possible that Marjorie Post's candelabra once incorporated similar mirrored panels in place of a shade that you see here. Turning to a few of Marjorie Post's favorite porcelain services with floral decoration, this Sev dinner service was commissioned as a diplomatic gift by Louis XV for the Austrian ambassador to France, Prince Starenberg. It was subsequently acquired by J.P. Morgan Jr., therefore often referred to as the quote Morgan service, and sold at auction after his death in 1944. Painted by Edmé François Bouya, a renowned painter of fruits and flowers, each piece is decorated with scattered pink roses within a broad blue band known as the Bleu Fellow, first used at Sev for this service. On top of the blue border is a gilt circle pattern known as partridge eye, painted again by Genevieve Tenandier, and is encrusted with clusters of various flowers, a rare technique only used for a short period between 1766 and 1771. It must have been one of Marjorie Post's favorite services as she acquired 150 pieces from the London dealer J. Rochelle Thomas between 1949 and 1962, often asking Joseph Davies to look for more pieces during his trips overseas. Another favorite service was this covered tureen and platter, one of a pair, decorated with large clusters of flowers, fruit, sheaths of wheat and garden tools, including scrolled handles with acanthus and laurel leaves. The tureen and platter were originally marked with the crossed L's for Sev, with the crown and a date letter in gold, now almost entirely erased, probably eliminated during the French Revolution. The tureen is made of hard paste porcelain, which Sev began producing in 1770. Although the Hillwood tureens have not been identified in the factory records, an identical design drawing by Duplessis of the model shown on the right, as well as a plaster cast, are still conserved at the factory and labeled Po à Oglio à Olive. An earlier pair of similar tureens decorated with wheat in place of the laurel and acanthus leaves, was ordered by Louis XVI for his brother-in-law, Joseph II of Austria, older brother of Marie Antoinette, for his visit to Paris in 1777. King Gustav, the, Gustav III of Sweden also ordered four similar tureens with ears of wheat in relief in 1784. A nearly identical pair of tureens and one of the platters were acquired by Marjorie Post from the Parisian dealer J.R. Osten, in 1949, when they were attributed to the set made for Louis XVI. Amazingly, the same dealer was able to locate a second matching platter that Post acquired one year later in 1950. In 1949, Post wrote to the dealer, quote, I shall be here about the other platter. I assume you are being as clever as I, and I will pay, pay for it 60,000 francs. Post initially placed the tureens in the French drawing room and then subsequently relocated them to a pair of console tables in the dining room, likely as a result of the acquisition of the large central sideboard in 1961 and the repositioning of several console and side tables. 
The sideboard incorporates perhaps the most impressive examples of porcelain with flower painting in the collection. Marjorie Post, like many female collectors of the 20th century, developed a passion for furniture inlaid with French porcelain plaques during the 1920s. The front of the sideboard contains three personal round and oval porcelain plaques with bouquets of flowers interspersed with vertical swags of fruit and flowers with ribbons and scrolls in gilt bronze. On the top are four small rectangular porcelain plaques of tavern scenes after paintings by David Tenier, the younger, separated by three small round floral plaques and ormolu swags and rosettes. On the sides are two small oval porcelain plaques of pastoral scenes and two rectangular panels of allegorical seated figures in gilt bronze. It is no wonder that the decoration of this piece was a source of inspiration for Konevsky's display of hollyhocks. At the time of its acquisition by Post, the cabinet's porcelain plaques were thought to have been made by Sev, but we now know that they are signed Honoré and Co, and were made in Paris, known as, porcelain, par known as Paris porcelain. François-Maurice Honoré founded a porcelain factory in Paris during the late 18th century, forming a partnership in 1816 with Pierre-Louis Dagouti, who owned a small porcelain workshop patronized by Empress Josephine and the Duchess d'Angoulême. Together, the pair received several important commissions, including a dinner service for American President James Monroe. Honoré's son, Jean-Baptiste Edouard Honoré, followed his father, father into the porcelain business, and after the joint Honoré Dagoti business dissolved, the Honoré firm continued to work independently in Paris and won a reputation for producing wares of exceptional quality and design, and was frequently commissioned to make fine porcelain for the royals and wealthy noblemen of France. Honoré's work was innovative, and he received several patents for the application of high temperature colored grounds and for the development of lithographic techniques. By 1846, Honoré was the leading producer of French tableware, much of which was specifically designed for the American market. One of Post's earliest acquisitions of furniture inlaid with Sevres porcelain plaques was this lady's writing table stamped by the Parisian cabinet maker and furniture dealer Nicolas Lanuet that she used in the French drawing room of her New York apartment, a detail of which I show you on the left. Here's a close up of the beautiful flower painting of one of the floor, four plaques attributed to Vincent Tenandier, as well as the Sev factory price ticket with flowering interlaced L's and inscribed with the price 72 in ink, which you can see here. Curiously, a jardinier with identical gilt bronze mounts and Sev porcelain plaques conserved today at the Philadelphia Museum of Art suggests that perhaps Hillwood's table may have started out life as a similar model to hold fresh flowers and was later altered to become a table with the addition of a marquetry inlaid top, bottom shelf and drawer. As a dealer as well as cabinet maker, Lanue may have been responsible for some of the subsequent alterations and not the original creator. A letter from the New York dealer, Henry Simons, dated December 16, 1927, shown on the lower right, offers Post a table associated with Marie Antoinette, decorated with Sev porcelain plaques, and previously altered into a table during the 19th century, possibly referring to this same piece. Another important acquisition of Sev porcelain inlaid furniture was this pair of jewel coffers made by Martin Carlin that Post acquired from Joseph Duvigne in 1926 and prominently installed in the French drawing room in New York. In a letter to Duvigne in February 1925, Post wrote, quote, the pair of bleu Sev cas casquet de mariage are the most lovely things I have ever seen and I would like to have a few months time in which to digest their prices mentally, but so much like to have them, end quote. Post gifted both coffers to her daughter, Eleanor Close Barzam, who subsequently bequeathed them to Versailles in 1961, where they remain today. Post was also interested in early 19th century Sev porcelain. This impressive mounted vase with birds and floral decoration known as the vase floral or floral vase 
was acquired by Post in 1963 and is believed to come from the collection of Lord Rothschild in London, presumably Victor, the third Baron Rothschild. Between 1800 and 1847, Alexandre Brognard served as the director of the Sevres Porcelain Manufactory and called upon Madame Knipp, natural history painter to Empress Marie Louise and one of the few independent women contract workers at Sevres to create the birds on this vase, drawing on species from Southeast Asia, India, and Africa. The vase was designed by Evariste Fragonard, son of the well-known 18th century painter, Jean-Honoré Fragonard. Archival records at Sevres reveal that there were three vases made of the same design. Two were completed in December, 1822, and were sent to the Louvre for the annual exhibition of works produced by the Royal Manufactories. Immediately following the exhibition in January, 1823, the vases were delivered to the Duc d'Angoulême, likely as a gift for his wife, the surviving daughter of King Louis XVI and Queen Marie Antoinette. Hillwood's vase entered the stock for sale at the factory in November, 1824. Large vases like these could only be made in the more durable hard paste porcelain and demonstrated the factory's technical achievement. Post also had an interest in porcelain figures with floral decoration, historically used as table decoration that replaced the costly sugar sculptures that once decorated dining tables in the 18th century and similar to how they are currently displayed on the dining room table alongside Konevsky's creations at Hillwood. Allegorical themes representing the four seasons were important subjects in European art and were produced by a variety of European porcelain factories in England and on the continent. Porcelain figures like these depicted each season by a particular attribute and pose. Spring holding posies, summer with a sheaf of wheat, autumn with a basket of grapes, and winter carrying a bundle of firewood. Like her mother, Eleanor Close Brausam was also a collector of decorative arts and acquired many pieces of porcelain on the Paris art market for her residence on the fashionable Rue de Monceau and country home in vaux sur seine the 2017 Sotheby sale of Eleanor's collection revealed that she was interested in a range of porcelain flowers and floral decoration, including French faience, Delft, Meissen, and French porcelain from the Vincennes and Sevres and Menacee factories. She may also have owned one of the two Bleu Celeste punch bowls, similar to the one on the bottom left, originally part of the Louis XV service, but unfortunately gave it away to her dentist. Turning to our last 20th century collector for the evening, I would like to conclude with the porcelain collection of Mrs. Jane Reitzman and highlight a few parallels with Marjorie Post. Jane Kirkman Reitzman was born in Michigan in 1919 and grew up in Los Angeles. In 1944, she married Charles Reitzman, and in 1947, the couple purchased Blythe Dunes, a 28-room oceanfront estate in Palm Beach. The property featured existing all white interiors by the English decorator Siri Mogham, whose international list of clients included Noel Coward, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, and fashion designer Elsa Scaparelli. In the United States, Mogham's clients included Babe Paley in New York and Jean Harlow in Hollywood. Mrs. Reitzman was keen to leave her own mark on the house and enlisted Stefan Boudin from Maison Jensen to collaborate on a redesign. Boudin encouraged his clients to consider the refinement, skill, and quality of 18th century French furniture and decorative arts. In Jane's words, she quote, I started sort of Marie Antoinetting it up, end quote. Within a few years, Mrs. Reitzman and Boudin transformed Blythe Dunes into an American triumph of courtly French taste. Blythe Dunes was just five minutes away from Post's estate at Mar-a-Lago, and it is extremely likely that the two women were acquainted and crossed paths in Palm Beach. Reitzman and Post also had influential acquaintances in common, including First, La First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy. As Blythe Dunes began to fill up in the 1950s, the Reitzmans purchased an ideal New York repository for their expanding private collection, 
Baroness Renee de Becker's magnificent Manhattan apartment at 820 Fifth Avenue. This photo of Reitzman in her New York apartment on the left reveals highlights of her collection, including an ebony Louis XV table in the foreground, made for Madame de Pompadour, and subsequently owned by the Duc de Richelieu, topped by Chinese porcelain vases mounted with French porcelain flowers. It is also decorated with a collection of rare snuff boxes, a similar collecting interest of Marjorie Post, who displayed her collection in Louis XVI style vitrines in the French drawing room at Hillwood, shown on the right. Reisman also had a particular passion for mice and porcelain birds, modeled from life, with flowering bases that she displayed on gilt brackets and on mantles in the spirit of Augustus the Strong's collection at the Japanese palace in Dresden. Like Marjorie Post, Reitzman also had a passion for Chinese celadon and Japanese kakemon porcelain potpourri vases with elaborate French gilt bronze mounts, the majority of which were subsequently donated to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the 1970s and 80s to furnish the French period rooms named in her honor. I would like to conclude with these last two images from Jane Reitzman's collection in keeping with tonight's theme a pair of cabbage terrines and garniture of topiaries by Vladimir Konevsky that were sold at Christie's last October following her death, illustrating Reitzman's interest in contemporary interpretations of antique porcelain forms and her collecting activity that continued all the way until the end. Thank you for your attention and for coming tonight and I'd be happy to answer any questions. That was terrific, Rebecca. Thank you. My name is Erin Lurie, and I'm the head of adult audiences at Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens. And tonight I have the pleasure of being our moderator. We have a couple of questions already, but if there are brewing questions in your mind, please submit them using the Q&A module that should be down by the bottom um, near the chat feature. And if you, uh, you might need to tap your mouse or tap your screen to get those icons to show up, but we do want to hear from you. Rebecca, we got a question early on in the program asking about hard paste versus soft paste, and particularly noticing that we tend to refer to hard paste as true porcelain. Does that mean that soft paste is not true? Yes, it does mean that soft paste is not technically true porcelain. Um, the, the sort of simplified answer to this question, which is a very good one um, and is, is not always um, the most clear and, and, and hard, to, hard to grasp, I think. Um, true porcelain or hard paste porcelain that has a mineral inside the clay called kaolin. And this was a mineral that um, was discovered very early on in Asia, I think as early as the ninth century, and was and allowed um, the production of porcelain of a translucent, hard, white body that was non-porous. That's essentially what um, the Europeans were after and and seeking. And it took uh, it took years, hundreds and hundreds of years um, for the, the secret and the recipe to travel to, um, to Europe. And that's, that's sort of the premise for the exhibition uh, Luxury of Clay that I'm working on in February that will, I think, delve into that whole um, voyage from east to west a little bit more closely. Um, so in, before the Europeans discovered um, this, this necessary kaolin mineral in order to make uh, hard paste porcelain. And that was also, uh, the other big difference is it was fired at a much higher temperature than soft paste porcelain. So it's actually less fragile than soft paste porcelain. Um, so in the meantime, Europeans um, in, in Italy, for example, um, in Spain, uh, produced something called maiolica, which is essentially uh, an, earthen, just an a, a earthenware clay with certain minerals, but that does not include kaolin. And because that material was actually porous, it had to be glazed. And they used this tin glazed and Delft that did this too. So it was a tin glazed earthenware. And then you see the factories in France that we looked at, Rouen, Nevers, and some other factories in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries started copying, you know, producing their own tin glazed earthenware. Um, and then eventually soft paste porcelain, of 
course was um, produced in France um, earlier. Well, the first place actually was, um, I should back up for a second. The, the, it's a, it is a complicated story, but in Italy, um, the Medici factory, which didn't survive very long, did discover hard paste porcelain um, as early as the 16th century. But again, it did not last very long. Um, and then it was really uh, soft paste porcelain that um, became very popular in France, um, uh, of course, because the factories still couldn't produce hard paste. And then when deposits were finally found, you know, near Limoges, hard paste porcelain began to be produced um, at Sev, um, as I mentioned, in the 1770s. Russia was producing hard paste porcelain much earlier than France, and this, that was the, the Imperial Porcelain Factory, thanks to Empress Elizabeth in the 1740s. So it's really um, a timeline, I think, would be very useful <laughs> in tracking you know, tracking the production um, and development, it is it is complicated, but essentially the one ingredient that hard paste porcelain has that soft paste porcelain doesn't is this kaolin, and it is fired at a much higher temperature. Perhaps we'll see a timeline next Perhaps, and a, and a map and, and yes, and examples, I think, you know, always help to, to just, you know, illustrate Excellent. the evolution. Our colleague, uh, Eric Dietrich from the Walters, first said, Rebecca, that this was a wonderful lecture, and I agree, and invites all of us, especially those in the D.C. or Baltimore area, to uh, visit the Walters, where they do have the Sev Potpourri vase in the boat and ship form. Um, and he also mentioned in the chat that their pink elephant vases are currently off view but they're hoping to get them back in the rotation soon. Good, good. Um, I would love to show a case of elephant vases with our green green ones next to them and compare the 18th century to the later, the later example. I would love that. And I did mark for those of you who want to learn more about the Walters collection um, in that Q&A module, you should be able to see Eric's question, which I am going to mark as unanswered so that you can click on that link to their collection. He also let us know that the same way that Cindy Sherman uh, reinterpreted the Sev Tureen, Roberto Lugo did the same with the boat potpourri vases. And I cannot wait to see that. I have just started diving into some of Roberto Lugo's work and will definitely um, hunt down some pictures of those boat and ship forms. Oh, and Eric is sending another link. So I'm gonna mark that as unread as well so that anybody who wants to can look up at uh, Michelle Erickson Ceramics. Thank you very much for that. Georgiana asked Rebecca if Madame de Pompadour ever worked directly with the porcelain designers at Sev, if we know that she reviewed drawings or gave them ideas, or were they just trying their best to come up with something they thought she would like? It's a, it's a good question. I think that she had, I don't think that she would have been directly in touch because of her level at court. I don't think she would have been directly in touch with any of the workmen or painters or um, designers at Sev. There would have been a, a structure, I think, of communicating um, with the factory. I think she definitely had communications with Lazare Duvaux, who, you know, was this luxury Marchand Mercier um, who put these wonderful obje exotic objects together, pieces of, you know, with gilt bronze or mixing the mycin with the sev. Um, I think he knew her taste very well. And I think he would have been the one that, that would have been in touch directly with the factory. Excellent. We got a question about Blue Celeste, which is one of my favorite Sev colors. You mentioned that it was an extremely expensive color, if not the most expensive. What made that so expensive? Um, this is another good question, which comes up quite a bit, especially at Hillwood, where we have, you know, a French porcelain room almost entirely dedicated to this one color <laughs> of porcelain. Um, essentially, the, the answer that I always like to give, because it's really just the, the, the simplest watered down version, is that it was the hardest to fire. 
Um, it, this was produced, you know, in the 1753, 1754. This is still extremely early. Um, the founding of Vincennes porcelain factory was 1740. Um, you know, the 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 kiln and the experimentation with the with the temperature control, and again this chemist that was hired um, to Hello, his name is Hello H E L L O T, was brought on to in, um, to to invent these these new colors. It was just extremely difficult to produce, not only evenly, but because of the firing. Um, you also have an early color, the Blue Lapis. Um, and yellow is also being produced at Vincennes during these early years. And then, of course, at Sev, you have the pink and the green and, you know, the colors that we that we looked at a little bit with Pompadour later on. But it's those early years that especially that turquoise blue, which is so often associated with Chinese porcelain and, it, and royalty. And it was and it was Louis XV's service that really um, sparked, I think, a craze for this for this color, but it was really just the most complicated, um, difficult techni technically to, to produce. Excellent. Marsha asked what your thoughts are about the Bohm floral collection that's manufactured here in the US. Oh, I'm I'm not so familiar. I'm sorry. I'm 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 sort of stuck in the 18th century, but I will, I will, I will, I will certainly look that up. And as of course, you know, we're always um, interested in looking at contemporary examples related to the collection. And and I will, I will make a note. I'm glad it's not just me. And I please share some of the things you learn with me when when you get a chance to look that up. Cheryl Fields asked if the flowers in our Natier portrait are real or porcelain. Oh, I think they're real. I, I'm, you know, the allegorical portraits that Nati did of so many uh, royal family members, you know, as Diana, the Hunt. I mean, those were all, um, those would not have been porcelain. Those would have been, um, you know, inspired, but I don't know if they were actually, you know, if he, if he added those, um, in, you know, in his imagination or they were actually um, somehow modeled uh, with the, but those would have been based on real, real flowers. Excellent. Amy Peck Abraham asked how we know which artist painted the different parts of individual set pieces. So, I showed one example that actually has a signature. So, so you know, if we're lucky, um, often the painter and sometimes the gilder will actually sign um, a letter, an initial or a symbol on the reverse side of the piece of porcelain near the interlaced L's and date letter. You will have another mark um, identifying a very, I mean, it's not, you know, it's not often, uh, not all the time that you can make that identification. Sometimes you do it through looking at similar services and we know, you know, knowing the inventories, you can sort of match pieces to different services, but, but oftentimes you will have an extra mark, which will identify, will identify the painter. Um, and in the case of um, Madame Knipp, she, um, one of these, these rare female um, contractors would say she often signed her name on, not on the underside, but actually on the vessel itself. Both Rebecca and I had the chance to watch a fabulous lecture this afternoon by Alison McQueen, who Rebecca mentioned earlier, and it was a, it included some great examples of those pieces that have multiple marks, which as someone who doesn't spend my days looking at those, it was really interesting for me to see just how many different types of marks could be on, on a single piece. Yeah, it was to, to focus on a lecture of female collectors, but also female painters and, and um, craftsmen at Sev was, is a nice way to integrate both, uh, both topics. Carolee Heileman asked about the economic aspects of porcelain, talking through the fact that hard paste porcelain was less fragile and therefore sometimes more economical. Um, and mentioned that Madame de Pompadour was such a great marketer for French porcelain that that helped catapult French porcelain to be a success despite its expense. 
Yes, I think not only was she a great marketer and patron and promoter, but those diplomatic gifts and sending them to other courts um, was part of the, you know, her PR marketing technique um, to share, um, you know, the technology and the beautiful craftsmanship at Vincennes and Sev with other courts, especially, you know, in the courts uh, in Saxony and, you know, Dresden had um, had found, had discovered uh, hard paste, the recipe for hard paste porcelain as early as 1708, and Augustus the Strong was producing hard paste porcelain much much earlier. It was the first in in Western Europe. Um, I wouldn't say that it was it was the less expensive option during the 18th century. I mean, it's it, you have to remember that porcelain was extremely expensive. Um, and really, you know, even during Pompadour's time, only, you know, really the highest echelon of nobility and aristocrats and, and members of court would have been able to afford um, porcelain. And especially during Augustus the Strong's time, even though he's producing hard paste porcelain, I mean, extremely um, expensive and also durable in terms of material compared to soft paste porcelain, but incredibly difficult also to fire. If you think about mice and porcelain animals in the 1730s, I mean, those collapsed during during the firing, they were made in multiple molds, you know, firing cracks um, resulted uh, as a, because they were fired at such high temperatures. They, they were not necessarily, um, you know, um, the most, the most, they were, it, cost the factory, you know, a lot of money. And, and the reason you have nobility, uh, kings, princes, electors uh, in patronizing these factories is for the financial, you know, aspect to, because they are, it's such a costly endeavor. Dee Dee asked that, uh, mentioned that she's heard that Madame de Pompadour had her porcelain flowers scented. Do you have any information on how that might have been done? And does this harken back to perfume and seduction? I'm adding that commentary. <laughs> it is a great anecdote to perfume and seduction. And I would like to look into more of that. I've also read that. And we know that, um, I think I mentioned even in the gardens at Bellevue, there was a there is a reference to um, porcelain flowers that were scented in the garden. So I think this exchange of scent both inside with fresh flowers and also potpourri vases and oils and petals, and, you know, of course, to minimize any unpleasant scents in, inside and also have this play with fragrance of, of actually porcelain flowers was part of the game, especially for, for Pompadour and Louis XV, who, who loved who loved porcelain flowers so much and who really spent, as we, as we heard, so a huge, you know, a substantial sum um, very early on in their production to promote, especially promote their production. Um, I don't know what they were saying. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing some sort of oil, um, you know, of course, perfume. Um, this, is, this is the height of a lot of the production uh, in the 18th century in France, but I would like, love to know more about what, what scents and uh, how the fragrances were developed for the flowers. Um, Dame, Dame Rosalind Saville, who I mentioned, who was the former director of the Wallace Collection, I know she's working on a new pub, uh, an upcoming publication on Madame de Pompadour, and I, I imagine she, she may discuss more of that in the book. Terrific. I'm going to combine our last two questions into one because they are on the same theme. And I'm going to ask you to not only pick your favorite child, but to see if you can... Uh, put yourself in the shoes of our founder. Do you have a favorite piece of porcelain among the many objects in our collection? And do we know anything about what Post might have favored? And those come from two great Hillwood docents, Mary Slimp and A.B. Peck Abraham. <laughs> I should, I wonder if they have a, they might have an idea too of what she, her favorite was. Rebecca's putting you guys back in the hot seat. <laughs> so please feel free to tell us. Uh, such a good question. Um, I'm thinking of, you know, <laughs> Mary says, I wish I knew. Um, it's a great question. I should have been more prepared for that question. Um, I, I love some of the potpourri vases. I love the, the Chinese uh, vase with the pug. Um, I happen to love a pair of Meissen um, pug uh, 
and um, fig animals on, on gilt bronze stands that are in the French drawing room that I didn't actually show tonight. Um, I think I, I, it's so hard to to limit to just one. And I and I love porcelain inlaid furniture. So you know, again, those coffers that are no longer in the collection. It's wonderful that we at least have you know a few examples that she purchased. For Hillwood, as we saw with the sideboard, and of course the the small table with the the porcelain plaques from New York that's now in the bedroom. Um, I think, I mean, that you could say that she, you know, that was a, an early taste that she developed in the 1920s. So I'm sure that she, um, and that followed her, you know, from New York to other residences and then to Hillwood. Um, it's a wonderful question. I think. I think some of the services, the Morgan service, I clearly I think we can tell from correspondence with the dealer and also to Joseph Davies that she loved that Morgan service and wanted to, you know, really try to accumulate as many pieces from that service. I, I think she also loved the Prince Louis de Rouen Bleu Celeste service. That was another diplomatic gift. Um, commissioned in 1771 for Rouen when he became the ambassador to Vienna and she had um, cases, uh, leather cases made for that service. So it could be, it could travel, it could be displayed. So I think there's signs there that that was one of her favorites too. Um, I would imagine that she also loved the large Le Celeste terrine and platter that I showed um, from 1754. That could be that diplomatic gift when I'm pumping towards. It's hard to pick <laughs> just one, but um, I think we know that she really, you know, created these rooms to show the to show these pieces in, in accumulation, the, the, especially the blue and the pink. Well, as to your own personal favorite, know as you put things together for the luxury of clay next February that this might come up and we're all looking forward to hearing what your favorite piece is. And my guess is it's often the newest one that you've researched or something that's been recently conserved so we can see it in a new light. Rebecca, this has been an absolute delight. Thank you so much. And I wanna thank all of our visitors for joining us this evening. In a few moments, uh, when the webinar ends, you'll be redirected to a visitor survey. Please share your feedback with us. We do rely on that as we shape virtual programs to come. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. And I hope those of you in the DC area get to enjoy Hillwood's Gardens soon. Thank you. Have a good night.